Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this financial wellbeing webinar hosted by Matt Holly Woods in proud partnership with Rugby League Cares, the official supporting charity of our game and all of its associated stakeholders. Can I first of all take the opportunity to thank everybody on the webinar this evening for both your time and your effort, firstly, to register your interest, then follow up with your attendance. It's greatly appreciated by everybody. So we know through extensive research conducted, not just in elite sport, that the skills, knowledge and expertise around managing finances that a person possesses or not in some cases, can have a direct impact on our whole of person well-being, both in a positive and a negative way. So taking this into account, it goes without saying that tonight's offering uh, with Adrian will contain education that you can apply not only now, but throughout your lifetime. Can I also quickly add that there will be a recording, a full recording of this webinar placed on the player portal. So without further ado, I'll hand over to our expert this evening, Adrian. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, expert's a big word, uh, but uh, yeah, nevertheless, um, uh, thank you everybody and, and welcome along to the webinar this evening. Again, uh, like Steve, I really appreciate you making the effort in an evening to uh, come on and join in with the webinar. Uh, I'm not going to keep you very long. I hopefully will be 30, 35 minutes maximum. We're not going to take up the whole hour because um, I'm conscious that I want you to be able to get back to your lives. However, we are here uh, as part of a regular quarterly visit on different topics and subjects to do with money and money management. Um, we've already looked at the cost of living and having a budget, and managing our money in our first webinar. If you have missed it, it is available on the player portal, so you can go back and have a look and watch again. Um, moving on to this quarter, which is the spring webinar series, if you like, uh, we are going to look at debt and borrowing. Debt's a very negative word. I don't want you to see it as being negative in any way. We are all debtors throughout our financial life, but it is something that we need to keep an eye on, especially in the current economic climate, which I'll come on to and talk to in a minute. Um, obviously, as Steve said, it's part of a kind of a whole of person well-being. I do want to tell you that in a corporate environment, so in a normal workplace like, like I work, you know, employers do really want to focus in on people's uh, physical well-being, their mental well-being, and their financial well-being, which is a key part of looking after your overall well-being. Because you'll know yourselves. If something runs out of control, then, you know, it has an impact in other areas. If you're having problems with your finances, you're probably going to be a lot less likely to put maximum effort into training. And, you know, you know, you physically have to build yourself up to get on with something. Uh, and it can have also, you know, a knock on, uh, knock on side on your mental uh, capabilities as well. You tend to be awake at night staring at the ceiling, writing lists about things that you need to do. So we do need to be on top of our finances. So during the webinar, we are just going to look at debt and borrowing. Do apologize in advance, but it's far from a boring subject. It's actually a very interesting subject to cover. Before I go on, I just want to make sure that we uh, know that I'm not here to give you any financial advice whatsoever. We are just taking a practical look at the topic of borrowing money and how we can make sure that fits in with our day to day financial plans. Also, all the information in the webinar is correct at the time of this, this recording being taken and me delivering the webinar. And it does relate to the 2024 25 tax year. So that's the legal bits out of the way. Our lawyers make us say that. It's always a bit long and drawn out. Also, normally I have one of my colleagues who's doing the Q&As in the background. Uh, unfortunately, I'm on my own this evening uh, due to uh, my colleague Mark being away on holiday in New York. I'm sure he's having a fabulous time. I will, though, take time at the end of the webinar to have a look at questions that you might post, and I'll try to answer them if I possibly can do while we're on the webinar. So if, if, if there's any comments or any questions about what we're talking about during the webinar, please post them uh, in the Q&A section that you can see down the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, in the Q&A section, you'll see a text box. Type a question in there. Nobody else on the webinar can see that question. It's only myself who'll be able to see that question. So I won't name anybody or point anybody out. So you should feel free that it's in private and in confidence that you ask a question. But I'll try and address the answer to the whole group when we get right through to the end. Also, um, if I don't get the opportunity to answer a question during the webinar, 
We do have a note of what was asked and when, and I will email back to you because we have your email addresses after the webinar closes, which just brings me very on to a key point that we don't use your emails for any other purposes than just for joining these Rugby League Cares and Matty Hollywood's webinars. So we don't sell them to third parties. We don't send marketing material out or anything like that. We delete them after we finish the webinar. So please do take the time out to uh, ask questions and I'll try and address them at the end. Now, borrowing or debt is a really important part of all of our financial lives because we've all got to do it from time to time. I don't know anybody on this webinar who's got a thousand pounds who can go out and buy a brand new mobile phone with it. I definitely don't have enough cash in the bank to go out and buy a house if I wanted to. So we use borrowing to make ends meet during our week to week and month to month financial planning. But we do need to make sure that we keep on top of it and that we always shop around to get a good deal. Now, one of the things with debt and borrowing is that we tend to think, oh, I've got it. Therefore, you know, I don't want to change it. I'm just going to keep with that one product to that one service. When in actual fact, we should look around and shop around from time to time because we could get some really good deals on borrowing money, which might make it more worth our while. Now, when we think about debt and borrowing, there's the obvious things that we use from time to time, credit cards, overdraft facilities, purchase plans, higher purchase agreements for cars. If you get a mobile phone, that's a higher purchase agreement as well for the handset, as well as data and other things thrown into it as well. These are all forms of finance. Now, I don't want to teach you to suck eggs, but the way in which we shop around for borrowing is by using something called the APR, which is the annual percentage rate. Quite simply, the higher the interest rate, the more we're going to owe back when we borrow money. The lower the interest rate, the less we end up paying back. So it's really important for us to use the APR on these products and services to compare them and see if we could get a better deal for whatever it is that we're borrowing money to achieve. Once we've started to borrow money and we're building up different borrowings, we need to keep on top of them. And the easiest way to do that is no more uh, difficult than keeping a list. So we should write a list with the most expensive debt first. That's the one with the highest APR. So you might think, well, the biggest debt I've got is a mortgage, and it, it may well be if you do have a mortgage, and we'll come on and look at that in a short while. Um, but that's likely to be the cheapest debt to keep repaying back, whereas something like a balance on a credit card would be much, much higher probably in interest rate. So that's the one we should focus on paying off. And as a reminder, whenever we borrow money, we should always have a plan to pay it back in a reasonable period of time with as little interest as possible. I did want to mention credit cards here because we can use them to borrow money quite cheaply. There are lots of credit cards on the market that still have a 0% interest on them for a limited period of time. So we can go out and borrow money and pay it back and not pay any interest on it if we are repaying the balance. Uh, likewise, if you're carrying a balance on a credit card, don't be ashamed to go out there and look for a deal where you can transfer that balance onto a 0% rate rather than paying something in between 15 to 40% interest on it. And most credit cards will be up there at that higher end, somewhere between 30 to 40% APR if you are carrying a balance. So it's really easy to shop around. I'll show you some websites, obviously, at the end where you can do that. Um, do, I, I always hesitate when I get to this point because I didn't write these slides. One of my colleagues did, and they said, avoid store cards. And, and really, I cannot find a way for making store cards work for anybody. Um, you know, you might say, well, well, I get a discount at the till on it. Uh, well, great. But you could probably buy that product cheaper somewhere else in the first place. So um, and also um, these three box uh, circles that we have here, not boxes, circles um, are rising in interest rate as we go along the line. And store cards tend to be even higher APRs, uh, even higher interest rates than our credit cards and overdraft facilities. 
And um, lastly, I know no one should be troubled by this on the webinar, but if ever you see anything to do with payday loans, you should really walk away from them. We introduced legislation actually a few years ago to try and get rid of payday lenders in the UK. And all they did was set themselves up overseas, give themselves new names and carry on operating in the UK from overseas. So again, the APRs on these things can go way over a thousand percent interest. Um, so, um, you know, things we have things in the UK like credit unions. If you've got a good relationship with your bank, you would probably be able to borrow money at a cheaper rate from a bank. Um, nobody should be using payday loans in any way. So moving on, on, on from that, I, I just wanted to underline the point about how we manage debt. And that is that we use the APR to shop around. We make sure that we know how much we owe and who we owe it to. And then we make sure that that fits into our monthly budget. Because one of the warning signs that we might be becoming over indebted is when a considerable amount of our free income is going towards repaying debts. Now, having a mobile phone or having a car on a contract, those are all normal, uh, normal debts to have. But we need to make sure that we keep it in check and that it's not overwhelming us with the amount that we owe. If we are overwhelmed at any point, there are lots of people that can help with that. And again, I will show you some websites later on that will be able to help with that. But what we really want to do is keep a note of who, who we owe money to, how much we owe, and then can we get a better rate or a better deal or can we pay it off sooner? You are a consumer. You can shop around. Uh, it is entirely up to you, though, what you do with the information, whether you want to actually take that on board or just carry on with one particular product. So in order to try and um, wake you up on the topic of uh, debt and borrowing, you should have a poll on screen and it should be asking you a really simple question. Have you checked your credit score recently? If you could just let me know, yes, I've seen it or no, I've never seen it before. Uh, that would be really good. What I have to do is actually pad for about 20 seconds until the uh, clicks that you click on screen come over to me so I can see the results of the poll. So I am going to hesitate until I see a few answers popping up on the screen. Uh, they're just coming through to me now. Um, most people have checked their credit score and seen it, which is a really good thing. And um, we do have, uh, you know, a very small number that haven't seen their credit score. So this might be quite interesting to you. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to vote on that. I'll close that poll off uh, and we'll move on. And I'll tell you why. It's really interesting to look at your credit score from time to time. Well, quite simply, um, if you have a good credit score, you're going to get access to good products and good services from the financial services industry. So if you think back to us talking about switching accounts around and shopping around for a good deal, if you've got a good credit score, that's going to be really easy to do. The flip side of the coin is if you have an average credit score, or a poor credit score, then you are going to get access to average products or poor products from the financial services industry. I'm really sorry, but that's just the way it goes. Um, checking your credit score should be free to do. So it's something that you can go away and have a look at. You can see the main companies on screen there that do credit scoring in the UK. Let me just say, if anything is ever wrong with your credit score, you can go back to the company that you use to look at it and ask them to investigate it. Again, it's free of charge. They'll investigate that, hopefully, they will correct that for you and they'll also pass on the details of that correction to the other credit scoring agencies. So they share their information and data across all those different organizations. Should always be free. And um, let me point out when you go on uh, to one of these websites and you have a look at your credit score, there are two things that you need to check. The first is the score itself. Big swinging arrow, loads of numbers, and it'll tell you whether you've got a good average or poor score. Should be really easy to see. But sitting alongside that is an actual report of all the things you've got in your financial armory. And that's the bit that you need to check. Now, it's it probably more important for uh, a rugby player or someone who's in the public eye to check that because it is really easy to get your personal basic personal details because you're a person who plays for a rugby team 
and I'm sure on some website somewhere or other, it's got your date of birth and your full name and, you know, the area that you live in. So it's really easy to start to compile information about you. If you are a victim of any kind of a financial crime, then this is one of the first places where it's going to show up is looking at that report that sits alongside your score. So that's why it's really important for you to check this and keep on top of it on a regular basis. Uh, I'm often asked, well, what do I do if I want to improve my score or I don't really have a very good score because I'm very young? I fully appreciate that. There are some simple things that you can do to improve your score. Number one, make sure you've got the right name and address on all of your accounts and that they all match. Now, you can get that from the, you know, that report side of, of checking your credit score um, and you can tick things off and make sure. But make sure you don't have any old bank accounts floating around from when you were younger and you've, you know, you've abandoned them and the address is still at your, like your mum and dad's address or something like that. Get all of those things up to date. Make sure you're registered to vote. Get onto the electoral roll. That is another great way to boost your uh, credit score um, and also prove that you can borrow money and pay it back on time. Um, so I, I've used this, this story before, but my son, um, when he passed his driving test, wanted to get finance for a car. He was knocked back because not that he had a poor credit score, but he had no credit history. So what we did is we got him a credit card. Every month we put 10 or 20 pounds on that credit card. Every month the mug of a father here paid off that credit card in full for him. Um, and then at the end of 12 months, he found that his credit score had risen quite dramatically, applied for finance on a vehicle and was successful in getting it and, and had his nice car from then onwards. So some debt can be good debt if we manage it in the right way. So moving on from the day to day stuff to do with borrowing money and making sure we keep it in check and making sure we keep on top of it. Uh, there is something in our economy which greatly affects how expensive it is to borrow money, and that's interest rates. Now, we are in a period of very high interest rates. I'm sure you know this already. But uh, again, just to go from the very b basics and build up here. As you can see from the chart, we have lived in a great period of low interest rates for a long period of time. They've barely broken above 1% um, at the Bank of England. And then you can see that line going very steeply upwards. And those are the knock-on effects of the things that have happened to us over the last three or four years that have all come together all at once to affect us. If you think back to things like lockdowns, war in Eastern Europe, war in the Middle East, all of those things cause economic uncertainty. They've caused the, the raw cost of the energy that we use, whether that's petrol in the car or gas and electricity that we use to be sky high. That increase in the cost of living has driven interest rates to be high. And the Bank of England have raised the base rate to try to rein that back in. Now, let me just explain how that works so you understand the knock-on effect. The Bank of England set the base rate. That's the rate upon which all of the financial institutions price their products and services. They're currently at a rate of 5.25%. So if we're putting money into the bank, we would expect to get somewhere close to that. We can get above it, but we most of the time we expect to be just below that. So the bank makes a little cut on that rate. If we want to borrow money, we would expect that to be above it. So the bank charges slightly above that rate and that's their profit margin on lending out money. So that's how those base rates work. And they are at the moment, as I said, at 5.25 percent. Now, the chaps at the Bank of England meet every six weeks or so. They have a cup of tea, a few biscuits, and they have a chat about how they think the economy is going. I expected in the recent meeting that they were going to reduce interest rates down, and they didn't. They left them where they are. So that's an indication that those rates at 5.25% may be around for a while to come. They may well come down as the year progresses, but not quite as fast as we thought that they were going to do. The knock-on effect of that is whenever we borrow money, we're going to be paying more money to the banks and the loan houses that have loaned us that money because interest rates have gone up considerably. This is going to affect you if you have a mortgage at the moment because you may well have set a rate during that low time that you can see in the chart where it was at a low rate. Whereas if we're having to renegotiate that mortgage now, we're having to do that at a higher rate and it is going to cost us more money.
More on that in a in a while when we when we go through and, and look at mortgages. Um, we'll take a look at it a little bit later. Uh, we'll take a look at it a little bit later on as far as interest rates go. But as a result of that, mortgages is actually a really interesting area of managing our own personal finances and how much it is to borrow money. I, I'm I'm not going to go through all of this in great detail because we could talk about this for a full like hour. Uh, we could do a whole webinar just on mortgages themselves. But I do want to touch on a few things to do with mortgages because I think it's important to know where we are now in our current economy. So the first thing that people always ask about is how much can I borrow as far as mortgages go? Uh, and it's really interesting that when you do a mortgage application or when you come to renew a mortgage, the most important part of the process is your budget. So the very first thing a mortgage advisor or a mortgage broker is going to look at is what your income is and what your expenditure is and what your expenditure items are and the capacity to keep a mortgage within that budget. So if you think back to the first session that we did where we were talking about cost of living, having a budget, making sure you can make ends meet and looking after the pennies and pounds, that's really, really important to the mortgage process now because that's the first thing they're going to want to see. After that, of course, borrowing is based on your income. So let's roughly talk about four to four and a half times your salary. Uh, and four and a half is an absolute cap, an absolute maximum. If you earn £30,000 a year, you can expect to borrow about £135,000. If you're a couple who are together and you both earn £30,000 a year, well, we could take that joint income and you could expect to borrow about £270,000, which is four and a half times that amount. The other thing you're going to need is a deposit or make sure that you're within what we call borrowing to uh, value limits. Nobody is going to give you a 100% mortgage for the full value of the whole house. Mortgages at the moment are capped at about 95% of the value of the house. So again, if you wanted to borrow 100,000 for, uh, if, you, if you were looking to buy a 100,000 pound house, should I say, then you're going to be looking to borrow around the 95 thousand pound uh, uh, 95 thousand pound mark and you'd have to find a deposit for the other five percent so those are roughly the rates that we're looking at at the moment uh, of course the exciting bit is finding a house I'm not going to say too much on this I'm sure you know all the apps and websites that you can use and um, just a couple of things from me really if you are looking to move or to buy a house I think it's just really interesting to go to that area because sometimes you still do get uh, for sale boards which aren't online um, from you know little family estate agent businesses that work just within that local area also really interesting to um, go to that local area because you want to make sure you're not buying uh, a house next to a school if you don't have children because people are just going to park all over your driveway in front of your house all day long as they go in and out of school um, but if you've got children it could be really handy because you can just walk to the school and back to do the school run in the morning vice versa i once bought a house next to a pub you do want to go there late at night and make sure they don't book live acts because this particular pub started to do that um, and that's just going to keep you awake at night with the noise and the volume. So choose carefully because we want you to like the house that you buy um, if you buy a house. But again, moving on to the important part of the financial element of it. Um, we do, as we stand here or we sit here tonight and we're on this webinar, there are around 12,000 different mortgage products available on the market. So it is impossible for me to tell you about how each one of those 12,000 different mortgage products work. But we can group them together into types of mortgages so we understand roughly each type. And again, I just want to make sure we've got a little bit of knowledge on how these work. So hopefully when we're either going away to buy a property or we're having to renegotiate our mortgage, we know the choices and the options that are there. So firstly, the most popular mortgage at the moment is called a repayment mortgage. Now, in the financial services world, we call it a capital and interest mortgage. What this type of mortgage does is in the early years, uh, we're paying quite a lot of interest on the loan because we owe a lot of money. But a little bit of our payment comes off the total amount that we owe. 
And that ratio slowly changes on the way through the mortgage so that near the end, we are mostly paying off the balance that we owe the bank. And there's a little bit of interest because the overall amount that we owe is it's a curve, really. But we start off paying a lot, but that amount just comes down and you are guaranteed to own the property at the end of that period. Now, the other type of mortgage that we could go for would be something called an interest only mortgage. It does exactly what it says on the tin. We're only ever paying the interest on the loan and we need to have something running alongside it that's going to pay back the loan at the end. And that would be some kind of an investment product or an investment plan, which is going to build over, say, 25 years. And um, we, we missold these in the financial services industry a number of years ago. And you'll have seen all the headlines about it, I'm sure, about endowment policies. Um, but you do need to make sure that that investment is going to pay off the mortgage at the end. Um, now, you might have been told it will not only pay off the mortgage, it'll buy you an island and an airplane and everything that you want, but it might not pay off the mortgage. And that's the key thing. You might end up having to give the property back or sell it if you still owe a lot of money back at the end of it. So those are the two main ways in which we can set up the mortgage in the first place. Then after that, we've got some more choices to make. We've got how we pay our interest. Now we can fix that interest for a period of time so that we always know how much interest we're going to be paying. Therefore, we really know always how much we're going to be paying for our mortgage over that fixed period of time. Or we can set it to be flexible with the Bank of England base rate that we looked at earlier on. So if that base rate goes up, our mortgage payment goes up. If the Bank of England rate comes down, then we owe less because our rate comes down as well. There are two ways of doing that. There's, called, there's one called a, a tracker, which is going to offer you a rate slightly above the base rate. And that's going to track upwards and downwards with the rate. Or if you do absolutely nothing and you're a current mortgage holder and you're at the end of a deal, you'll go on to what's called the variable rate or the standard variable rate. And that's really high at the moment. That can be around 8% interest that you're paying, which is really, really high. So for that reason, it is still useful if you're coming to the end of a deal to make sure that you can negotiate some kind of a rate, either a fixed or a tracker rate where it's more manageable than being on that variable rate, which is which is very high. Now, fixed rates normally last for two or three or five years. There are some longer ones if you want, um, but most people go for those periods of time because then you can reassess where your mortgage is and renegotiate another rate at the end of it. Just lastly, I wanted to uh, have a chat about, um, well, two particular types of people that you're going to come across in the mortgages world. Uh, you are going to either be talking to a mortgage advisor or a mortgage broker. Now, let me just differentiate between these two types of people who work in the mortgage industry because there's a big difference between the two. A mortgage advisor is going to be selling you a book of products that they have available to them from their organization. Just as an example, if you wander into your local high street bank uh, and see their mortgage advisor, they will be selling their bank's mortgages. They won't be selling any other bank's mortgages. The other type of person you might see would be a mortgage broker. And the clue is in the title there. They broke uh, deals with all of the different 12,000 mortgage product providers. And they'll look through them all to find the right one for you in your circumstances, with your credit score, with your budget, with how much you want to borrow. Uh, you know, they, they will look for the best one that's most suitable for you. And they'll run through all of the things that you can see on this slide with you. You know, they'll run through what happens after the initial rate ends. You know, what kind of setup costs are you looking at? Um, whether it's interest only or whether you're paying back the balance as a repayment. If there are any penalties for overpaying, underpaying or paying off a lump sum at any particular point, they can help you with, with all that information, as advisors can do as well. Um, but I, I tend to have the opinion that brokers can look at the whole of the market and find the best one that suits your circumstances. Um, so, uh, And again, just a reminder, you're going to have all those setup fees or early redemption penalties and all those kinds of things to consider when you're going through it. But a, a broker or an advisor, advisor can talk you through all of those important points.
If you're an existing mortgage holder on this webinar and you're already living in your house and you're listening to me from home, um, I would emphasize the need for you to keep on top of your existing mortgage deal that you have. It may well have been set a number of years ago when those interest rates were low. And you already know now that we're in a period of very high interest rates. So if your deal is going to be coming to an end in the near future, you need to start planning for that six months in advance of that deal coming to an end. The reason is really um, obvious because mortgage offers last for six months. So six months in advance, you can get a mortgage offer to go on to. And then if interest rates rise, you know you got the best deal possible within that six month window. But if interest rates go down, well, you can get rid of that offer and you can get a lower offer or renegotiate it down right up to the point where you need to move on to another either fixed rate deal or a variable rate deal. But what we want to avoid is inaction and going on to that standard variable rate that the banks charge, which again, just to underline, is really, really high and is going to cost you an awful lot of money to be on it. So something like a tracker might save us money in, in those circumstances, but you will need to start negotiating that six months in advance. So that's the main thing to bear in mind. Um, other than that, if you're a first time buyer and you're thinking about buying a house in the near future, um, again, just to underline how much of a deposit you're going to need to do that. So the minimum deposit is going to be 5% of the value of the property or the size of the mortgage that you're going to be taking out. Uh, now, if you can possibly stretch to 10% of the value of the house that you're buying, then you will get a better or lower mortgage interest rate because you've saved up or are putting in um, a larger amount of equity into the loan in the first place. So again, if you're looking to buy a house for 150,000, you're going to at the minimum need 7,500 pounds as a deposit. But if you happen to have 1,500,000 pounds, sorry, 15,000 pound kicking around, you'll get access to lower borrowing rates. So something worth bearing in mind, especially in this climate where we've got high interest rates. Uh, also, you can use things like lifetime ICES to help you save up for your deposit. Um, so if you haven't heard of them, go away and have a look at them because the government bonus is 25% on the money that you pay into a lifetime ISA up to a maximum of £4,000 a year. If you were to pay £4,000 in, you'd end up with 5000 in the account because the government would uplift it by 25%. You did hear me right. It is 25%. So, okay, if you're looking to save up for that um, for that deposit, go away and look at lifetime ICEs, which can be really useful. And lastly, if you're buying a home, you're going to need slightly more than the deposit. There are things like legal fees, local searches, anti-money laundering checks, telegraphic transfer fees. Again, have a chat with your mortgage advisor or mortgage broker and they'll be able to talk you through those additional fees. But you are going to need to just set a little bit of extra money aside to pay for all of those things. And of course, once you move in, well, you're going to have to pay for gas, electricity, council tax and all the rest of it. So again, a broker or an advisor, if you're a first time buyer, will just help you put together that first budget so you can get into the house and afford everything for it to be within your budget. So what now? I did promise I was going to be talking for about 35 minutes. I don't want to over egg this. Uh, there's lots and lots of things to do with mortgages. And I can see a red dot on the right hand side of my screen, but I can't see the question yet. I will have a look at your question in a moment and try and answer it. Um, just I mentioned on the way through that there are lots of really useful sites for people to take advantage of. Uh, and I'm just going to run through them here. Now, I could talk about lots of different things and I could, you know, I'm not allowed to recommend products and services in any way. Way. But the moneysavingexpert.com website is absolutely flipping brilliant. There's loads of really useful information on there so you can read further about any of the things that I've spoken about on the way through the webinar tonight. So have a look on the Money Saving Expert. That's a great site. The government version of the uh, Money Saving Expert is called the Money Helper site. 
Uh, they also uh, add into that also debt advice as well on there. So um, the word debt advice always sounds really negative. It's not. But if you are struggling, if you put your hand up and ask for a, a call from them or a chat with them, you really will find that there's loads of help out there for you. Obviously, if you're looking for a house and mortgages and borrowing, well, there's the Zoopla and the right moves and the on the markets of this world. Um, but again, just a tip, if you're moving to a new area and you're not really familiar with that area, do go and have a drive around just to make sure that the home that you're buying is in the right area for you. And whilst you're driving around, you may well see some for sale boards that are not on those main websites because it's really expensive to advertise on those websites. If money troubles ever become an issue, first of all, just email or contact me. I am more than happy to sit down and have a chat with anybody who's struggling with their finances. I've struggled in the past. Other people I know have struggled in the past. There's no shame in saying I'm really struggling with this issue and I need some help with it. Can you help me out? And we can have a look through things and we can get them sorted out. There's always a solution to financial problems. I promise you, always a solution should you need it. Also, uh, there are organizations like Citizens Advice and National Deadline who are just as good as any commercial organization at helping and sorting out and speaking to people might just be putting you on the right track. My daughter and I had a cause to ring Citizens Advice Bureau recently. They were exceptionally good, superb customer service, really good information back to us, helped us to get on top of the problem that we had. And we got that sorted out really, really quickly and easily. So again, I, I can't recommend them enough. Um, if you don't want to speak to myself or anybody, you know, to do with your club, uh, then you can speak to them as third party people and they really will help you out. Other than that, I can see that there have been questions. So can you just bear with me while I actually read them and have a look at them? Um, uh, as a rule of thumb, how regularly should I check on my credit score? Uh, well, I think that it's important to check your credit score once a month or once a quarter. I would say if we're starting to get to checking it every half year, then we're stretching it out a little bit. I think it's something that we need to keep on top of. But once you've done the first check and you've had a look at it for the first time and a proper good look through it, it then just becomes a monthly to do thing. Because with each of the companies that I spoke about earlier, they'll drop you an email to let you know that your new credit score is available. And you can just click a button on your phone, click into it, have a quick rumble around it and look at it. And that's the end of the matter. So it's going to take you no more than 60 seconds to just keep on top of it and make sure it's in the right way. But thank you for the question that was sent in. Other than that, we don't have any other questions. So I, I listen, I really hope that talking about uh, debt and talking about borrowing hasn't been boring on the way through, that you've actually learned a couple of things that you didn't know before you came on. But lastly, I want to say that we are here to help. So we support Rugby League Cares. Um, we have no agenda. We don't have any products to sell you in any way. That's not why we're here. We're here to support Rugby League Cares and deliver financial education. So if ever you've got a question or a query and you want to ask, my email address has been on this screen for quite a while now. It's adrian.firth at mattyollywoods.com. But you'll also find it on any of this and any of the other recordings that we put up on the player portal. So please do go on there and you'll find my contact details there. Very easy to get in touch. And, and I, I promise we'll help you out as much as we can. Other than that, thank you to Steve for the great introduction. Uh, thank you to you all for joining the webinar. And I really look forward to seeing you again sometime very soon. But in the meantime, have a good evening. Put your feet up and relax. Thanks.